These are the chapter two odd number homework problems continued. In number 11, we're asked to sketch a histogram in a polygon showing the distribution of scores presented below. So I'm going to begin with constructing my X and Y axes, the ordinate and the abscissa. On the ordinate, I will label my frequency. In the abscissa, I will label my X values. You want to take a look at the distribution that you're working with to construct um, the range of values on the ordinate and the abscissa. It's a fairly small distribution or range of scores, so I'm just going to use intervals of 1. And same with my X distribution. Okay, from our reading we've learned that a histogram is a is a bar graph and it's usually applicable to continuous variables where one value ends, the next one begins, and uh, we'll illustrate that visually by having no spaces in between the bars in our histogram. So the first value, um, we'll start here down at the bottom, working our way from left to right. So our x value is 2, and the frequency is 1. Okay, again, um, since we are constructing a histogram where one leaves off, the next one begins, which is why the center value here, too, is in the middle of this range. So it actually ranges from one and a half to two and a half. The next x value is three, and it has a frequency of four. Okay, four has a frequency of six. 5 has a frequency of 3, 6 has a frequency of 1, as does the score of 7. Okay, so this is what your histogram should look like. Um, again, the center of the range will be the whole numbers. Um, for this particular graph on our X distribution. This distribution looks uh, relatively symmetrical. Um, there are not a lot of outliers and we kind of get this normal curve shape. The next step is to construct a polygon using the same data. So we've learned from our reading that when we uh, use a histogram we should also recognize that a polygon is also applicable because histograms and polygons are used for interval and ratio data. So if you choose one, just know that you could opt to use the other um, when it's a histogram and polygon. Bar graphs are strictly used for ordinal and nominal data. So again, we'll construct our abscissa scale. and our ordinate scale. Okay, so again, working left to right using the data, um, we see that this is a polygon that we're going to construct. Um, so again, this is histogram. I should identify frequency histogram, and this is a frequency polygon, a line graph. So we have a score of two occurring once, so we would place our point here. We have a score of three occurring four times here. We have a score of four occurring six times, and a score of five occurring three times the score of six occurring once, and 
a score of seven occurring once. So we just, it's again the line graph. We connect these dots here. Okay. You should recognize that what I have here is actually incomplete. Um, it must, uh, all polygons must be brought down to the abscissa. To do so, we consider the values um, above the highest score. So what I mean by that is our highest score is 7. So to bring it down to the abscissa, we recognize that a score of 8 right, would have a frequency of 0. Right? So if we carry this over 1 to 8, we then properly bring it down to the abscissa on the high end. Similarly, if we consider the score below 2, so a score of 2 is not part of our data set, and so the frequency would also be 0. Excuse me, I wrote the wrong number. It should be a value of... 1. 2 is part of our data set, so excuse me, our x value is equal to 1, and the frequency would be 0. So we bring it down to the abscissa here, recognizing that 1 is not part of the data set, and therefore it would have a frequency of 0. And now we see that we have properly constructed our polygon. I want to point out that if we were to overlap our original histogram with the polygon, we would see the exact same shape. So what I'm going to do here is add 8. right? And so if we just put dots above the existing bars that we constructed, right? it will take the shape of the polygon that we just constructed. So again, illustrating that we can think of them as um, synonymous with one another, that if you're going to use a histogram, that you could also use a polygon. And remembering that histograms and polygons are used when we have interval or ratio data. It requires some numeric or quantitative data to construct this, these types of graphs. Number 13, we're given some data, um, in particular a survey given to a small sample of college students contained questions about the following variables. For each variable, identify the kind of graph that should be used to display the distribution of scores, histogram, polygon, or bar graph. So from our reading, we learned that um, when we have, we utilize histograms, Or polygons, we must have either interval or ratio data. Okay. When we um, utilize a bar graph, We know that that is applicable to data that falls into the scale of measurement of nominal and ordinal. Okay. So given that, um, we can use that information to identify the type of, of scale of measurement um, that these, these variables represent. Once we've identified the scale of measurement, then we can answer the question and identify what type of graph would be appropriate. So the first one, A says number of brothers and sisters. So if we're counting how many brothers and sisters we have, given the scales of measurement, we know immediately we're working with a numeric value. Um, so we can disregard the options of nominal and ordinal data, and we can then think about interval and ratio. And really, it does um, the distinction between the two is like split, splitting hairs. So we do have interval um, scales of measurement. That category exists for very specific examples, such as temperature, um, standardized test scores, above and below average, when we get to z-scores, z-scores are an example of interval scales of measurement. 
they're very, in other words, there are very few examples of interval scales of measurement, which is why they're condensed with the category of ratio scales of measurement. So anyway, we have, a, we're working with a number, right? Um, we know that it's quantitative. And if we thought about the characteristics of interval and ratio, interval says equal increments in between categories. Um, and ratio has that same characteristic, but also says that we have a meaningful zero. And meaningful zero means that the number line begins at zero and we cannot go below it. It's, it cannot be a zero value. So the options of um, when we're counting numbers of number of brothers and sisters, we can certainly have zero if we're an only child, but we couldn't have negative one, negative two, negative three. Um, because it starts at zero, we can say I have twice as many brothers as someone else. Um, so we can make those ratio scales of measurement or comparisons, I should say. So first of all, we identify this as ratio scale of measurement. And as a result, we know that we can use a histogram or polygon because they are um, identical to each other in terms of the data that we're using. It's just very, it varies in the presentation. The visual presentation is slightly different. One's a, hit, a bar graph and one's a line graph. Let's take this one uh, one step further and assess if we can determine if this is an example of a continuous or discrete variable. So again, our definition of continuous, it's a value that can be infinitely divided into smaller pieces or um, portions. So it can be expressed as a fraction, decimal, percentage. The um, definition of discrete variable is just a category, it's a named category, um, or it's just a category that cannot be um, divided into smaller pieces. So if we're talking about number of brothers and sisters, we should recognize that this is a discrete variable. We can, the options of reporting, I have two brothers, I have two sisters, I have three brothers, I have one sister we cannot report that we have a fraction of a sibling. So again, we recognize that this is um, a numeric value, which is a ratio scale of measurement, but it does not mean that it's going to be continuous. This is an example of a ratio scale of measurement that is discrete. All right, let's move on to birth order. So again, our first task is to identify the scale of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. And then with that information, we can identify the appropriate type of graph that should be used. So birth order. Okay, so we're going to report. You're the oldest, um, the youngest, the middle child, whatever it may be. Um, so oldest would be represented as the firstborn, the second born, third born, fourth born, so on and so forth. So even though we're working with a n number, um, we would not put that into the interval or ratio scale of measurement because we can't say in terms of interval scale of measurement that there are equal increments in between these categories um, because technically they're word categories. We can put this number attached to it but they derive originally from this word category, firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, so on and so forth. So we can also, uh, all, cannot also, um, or we also understand that it's not a ratio scale of measurement because there's no meaningful zero. Um, so we then realize that we're working with either nominal or ordinal data. And um, it should be pretty obvious. Again, it is a named category, so it does meet the characteristics of nominal data. But we can take it one step further and recognize it's ordinal because um, we can put those categories in order from lowest to highest. Firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, fourthborn, sixthborn, seventhborn, so on and so forth. So we've identified that this is ordinal. We're working with ordinal data. And as a result, we would use a bar graph. Right, where we would 
<clears throat> see how a frequency um, table would look something like this, right? So the firstborns, secondborn, thirdborn. Again, they're just categories, but they've been ranked. And <clears throat> let's say we're working with, <clears throat> excuse me, a sample of um, lots of individuals that were firstborn, a few secondborn, a lot of thirdborn individuals. So we have separate categories. The bars do not touch. Um, they're distinctly different from each other. And this should also help us understand um, what type of variable we're working with in terms of discrete versus continuous. So again, continuous can be infinitely divided into smaller portions or um, a fraction and discrete is usually a named category or just a, a category that cannot be expressed numerically as a fraction. So in this case we would also um, label this variable as discrete. Again this problem doesn't ask us to do this but it's um, a good data set for us to have that discussion of discrete versus continuous variables. The next one, gender. Um, as we've done with the two previous examples we need to first identify the scale of measurement um, the options male female immediately we know we're not working with a quantitative um, scale of measurement so interval and ratio are omitted and um, we look at nominal and ordinal again subjectively you know we may say females are better than males or vice versa males are better than females but objectively we can't put those categories in order so as a result we would conclude that this is a an example of nominal data meaning that they're just named categories and they cannot be ranked and consequently we know that we would use a bar graph finally if we want to determine if it's continuous or discrete we would conclude, again, it's not a number, and it cannot be infinitely expressed as a fraction or smaller portion, so we know that it's a discrete variable. Finally, the last one says, favorite television show during the previous year. So I'm not a big TV watcher, at least if not current TV. Um, so I did a quick little search of popular TV shows, so they include things like Modern Family, The Americans, The Walking Dead, Mad Men. So if I were to survey all of you, perhaps I'd name one of your favorite shows, perhaps not. Um, but I would get a, a list of named television shows and um, present them in some kind of graph. Well, if we have to determine first what kind of scale of measurement um, favorite television show would fall under. Again, immediately we know it's not a numeric value, so we can omit the options of interval and ratio, and we focus on nominal and ordinal. So given that we're just listing all of these different types um, or names of television shows, it would be an example of nominal. Now, if we consider ordinal, its characteristics say that they are ranked. I know that some of you may think, well, I'm saying my favorite, um, right? But you're just identifying a list of named um, television shows, and we would present them in this list where they're all considered equal, and we would then identify the frequency that each of those television shows were expressed. So let me just quickly show you what I mean. So just don't get hung up on this idea of favorite that that's first um, opposed to others. You just want to list your favorite show uh, during the previous year. So if we have, um, what did I say, Modern Family. I'm just going to abbreviate since I'm lacking in space. Um, the Americans Walking Dead, Mad Men. Okay, and so each category would be 
considered its own distinct category. So let's say you know, most people, a lot of people identified modern family as their favorite. Um, the Americans, kind of mediocre favorite. Um, Walking Dead, I hear a lot of students talking about that one. And then Mad Men. Okay, so again, just showing that even though you're saying it's your favorite, you perceive it as number one, we're just listing everyone's number one, and so then as a result, they become equal and they're no longer considered ordinal data. Um, so we're working with nominal. And as a result, we know that we're going to use bar, a bar graph, as I just drew here on the right. Sorry for the... Um, messiness of this graph, but I think you get the point. Um, and then finally, as we've done in the previous three examples, is it discrete or continuous? D continuous is going to require quantitative, quantitative data, and in this case we have qualitative data, so we know it's discrete. Um, that's it for number 13. Please know that every, not all ratio data is going to be continuous. Um, sometimes students get confused and think that if it's ratio, because it's quantitative, it's automatically going to be an example of continuous data or a variable. As we saw in A, that wasn't the case. Um, the other ones, when they are nominal ordinal, discrete is really your only option when choosing between continuous and discrete. Number 15, here we see that researchers uh, found that masculine theme words such as competitive, independent, analyzed, strong are commonly used in job recruitment materials, especially for job advertisement in male-dominated areas. In a similar study, research counted the number of masculine themed words in job advertisements for job areas and obtained the following data. Determine what kind of graph would be appropriate for showing that this, this distribution sketch the frequency distribution graph. So our first task is to identify what type of scale of measurement we're working with. So if we consider this data, um, this category, the number of masculine words, would be considered our frequency. In the area would be our x value. So let's consider this data here, the x variable. And if we are trying to figure out what scale of measurement is being used, our options again are nominal, named categories, ordinal, ranked categories, interval, ranked categories that he, he have equal increments in between each category, and ratio. A numeric value that has a meaningful zero. So if we consider that our x variable, the named categories of these different careers or professions, we know that it's not um, quantitative. We're definitely working with qualitative data. So we would focus on nominal and ordinal. And um, subjectively, we may say that um, bookkeepers are better than nurses and nurses are better than early childhood educators and so on and so forth. But objectively, we can't put those x values in any particular order or rank. So we know that we're working with nominal data. Again, just figuring out that we're working with either nominal or ordinal tells us the type of graph we can use. And we've learned um, from the previous examples and from our reading that in this case, we would be limited to using a bar graph each category is distinctly different from the other. Along those lines, if we wanted to determine if this is an example of discrete or continuous variable, we would conclude that it's discrete because we have, um, again, qualitative data. They're categories. And they're distinctly different from one another, and it, these values cannot be expressed um, as a fraction. All right, so the next task is to construct our bar graph using the data given. So I try to be as neat as possible. I do apologize. This isn't always um, as easy as it may appear. 
So we're at X values here. Again, these are the job advertisement categories. And we um, have our frequency ranging from a low number of 6 to 14. So I'm just going to count by 5s on the ordinate. 5, 10, 15, 20. And our first category is our plumber. Plumbers are electricians or security guards, and bookkeepers, nurses, and educators. Okay, so we're going to look at the frequency of how often these masculine themed words were used in the job descriptions for a plumber. So a plumber, we found that um, a lot of um, masculine theme word, words were used, and we have a value reported of 14. So we take that bar up to 14. Electricians, 12. The height of the bar represents the frequency. Security guards, 17. I guess that's not very surprising. Bookkeepers, we have um, a value of 9. Nurses, 6, and Educators, 7. And that's it. Um, given the data, our x values, um, we would place those on the abscissa, frequency on the ordinate, the height of the bar represents the frequency of those um, distinct categories, in this case, um, job advertisements. Number 17, for the following set of scores, place the scores in a frequency distribution table and then identify the shape of the distribution. So we'll begin by constructing our frequency table, identify our x values and the frequency. In order to ensure that I don't leave out any data, it's always a good idea to begin with um, identifying your sample size. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 scores total. And I check that because when I identify the frequency, I'm going to sum up my frequency to confirm that I've accounted for all 20 scores. So the sum of frequency equals sample size. So we have a high score of 9 and the lowest score of 4. So we're going to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, and 4. So we're going to um, tally the frequency or identify the frequency of how often 9 occurred. If we check our data, it occurred once. 8, again, once. The score of 7, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 times. Score of 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Score of 5, 1, 2, 3, Four, five, six, seven, and a score of four. We have that occurring once and twice. So again, um, crossing them out um, helps ensure that we don't leave anything out. But another way to check is to add up our frequency. Um, so if we seven and two is nine plus 1 is 10, and then plus 5 is 15, plus 4, 19, plus 1 more is 20. So we know that the sum of f is equal to 20, and that is the same as our sample size. So 
all is good. We've uh, accounted for all of the scores. Now, B says, identify the shape of the distribution. From um, the latter part of chapter two, we learned about um, a distribution that is considered symmetrical, right? Uh, a symmetrical distribution has a zero skew. And then we have um, positively skewed distribution. Positive skew means that on this x distribution, right, again, this is frequency. These are my x values similarly here. Right? As x increases, as we go from 0, right, and this, that, that increases, a positively skewed distribution shows that the higher x values have lower frequency, less frequency. And then um, the last type of distribution we may encounter is a, neg is a distribution with negative skew. And we can understand that in terms of frequency and x values. So again, if this is 0, as the numbers increase, Right, these higher values have higher frequency, and the lower values have less occurrences, so their frequency is lower. So, again, if you could think about negatively skewed distribution, means that the lower x values have smaller frequency, the higher values have higher frequency for positively skewed distribution, our larger x values have lower frequency, our lower x values have higher frequency. I hope I said that correct. So our higher x values have lower frequency and our lower x values have the higher frequency. In a symmetrical distribution, we're high, see, always going to see the highest frequency in the center of the distribution and tails being created on the high end and on the low end. All right, so without constructing um, the histogram for this data, we can assess and determine the shape by looking at our x values and then going back to what I said in, in regards to what a positively skewed distribution looks like opposed to a negatively skewed distribution. So if we consider the frequency here, right, if this was a symmetrical distribution, we'd see um, even scores on the high end here and on the low end, right? So they would, um, let's say, 9 and 8 had a frequency of 1. 4 and 5 should have frequencies similar to that, and we see that that's not the case. So we definitely know it's not a symmetrical distribution. Let's consider positively skewed distribution. So I said that the lower scores um, are going to have the higher frequency in comparison to the higher scores. So if we consider the lower scores, these scores here, these scores here, right, um, we see that they do have higher frequency opposed to the higher scores here. So these have higher frequency, lower frequency. Okay. So again, if we were to plot this out on a histogram, we would see that a tail would be pulling to the right because of the frequency here um, represented by these higher x values. So that's one way to assess and determine the shape of the distribution. Given the frequency is higher for our lower x values opposed to the frequency for our higher x values, we know that the tail is pointing to the right and we would conclude that this distribution has a positive skew. Okay. If that's a little hard for you to understand, um, by all means you can sketch out the histogram and then visually assess what it looks like in terms of are, are all the scores evenly distributed and you have a, a symmetrical distribution with zero skew or are the higher scores producing um, the tail to be pulled to the right or vice versa. The tail is being pulled to the left with lower scores having lower frequency. 
so we can go ahead and do that even though we're, we are not asked to do that um, for some of you it might be helpful to go ahead and sketch the histogram to visually affirm that we have a positively skewed distribution I'm going to put this little character here which means I'm going to omit some of the data and just start with my low score of 4 5 6 7 8 and 9 these are my x values and the frequency um, we have 1 all the way to 7 so I'll do 1 2 3 4 5 six and seven okay so if we do um, again we can do histogram or polygon a histogram again is a bar graph and the value that we're the x value will be in the center of that range um, for that bar so four had a frequency of two five had a frequency of seven Six had a frequency of five. Seven had a frequency of four. Eight had a frequency of one. And nine had a frequency of one. Okay, so now if you were to, um, again, en envision the polygon above it or just a, a smooth curve around this distribution we do see that the tail is to the right and again we affirm that it has a positive skew the step is not required for this particular problem but I find that it's helpful to affirm um, our understanding of zero skew, positive skew, negative skew looking at a, a table um, we should be able to assess the skew of a distribution but again if it's a little difficult to do that go ahead and, and plot the um, or construct the histogram or polygon so that you can visually understand and determine if the distribution is skewed or not in which in which direction positively or negatively skewed number 19 we're given the following data and asked to construct a frequency distribution table a histogram and then describe the shape, the center, and the sh um, and then determine if the scores are clustered together or they spread out across the scale. Um, so we'll begin with our frequency table. Our x values and our frequency. Again, it's always a good idea to identify what n is equal to. So if we count how many scores, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. 24 scores. Just to make sure that we account for all of the scores. Our high score is 10. And count down all the way to our low score, which is 2. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, three and two and then we'll tally the frequency for each value we look for how often ten occurred occurred once and twice nine occurring one two three four times eight one two three, four, five times, seven, one, two, three, four, six, one, two, and three, Five, we have one, two, four, one, two, three, and that here once, 
and then two occurring once. All right, this is um, quite messy, but again, if we count our frequency, and we sum the frequency, and we can make sure that we did not leave anyone out. So we have two plus four, six plus five, 11, plus four is 15, plus five more is 20, 22, 23, 24. So I'm just counting the frequency there and I come up with 24. So all X values are accounted for. And next we're asked to um, sketch a histogram showing this distribution. So similar to what I did in the last example. So we have our ordinate that represents our frequency and then our abscissa that represents our x values. So we have a frequency as high as 5, so I'll just count by 1's. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then our x values, um, lowest score of 1 and highest score of 10. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And uh, we're working with a, a so we're going to sketch a histogram, right? Um, so a bar graph. All right, so now we can create our bars over the actual um, x values. So starting on the low end here and the left side of the abscissa, we have a score of 2, and that occurred once. A score of 3, and that occurred once. A score of 4, twice. A score of 5, two times. 6, three times. 7, four times. 8, five times. 9, four times, and 10, two. Oops, let's take that little bar back and try that again. Um, two. Okay, so now we can kind of get a sense of the shape of the distribution. Um, again, based on where the highest frequency is occurring, we can determine if it's positively skewed or negatively skewed. Do we see higher frequency on um, the high end of the X scale or on the lower end? So we can, we can kind of go over it with a, a soft curve to kind of get a sense of what we're looking at. This should help us determine the um, shape of the distribution, again, because the higher X values have higher frequency here. Um, and these lower scores have lower frequency, we would conclude that this has a negative skew. This distribution is negatively skewed. Again, the tail is pointing towards the negative values. Okay, the next thing uh, we're asked to consider is the center of the distribution, or what um, score best identifies the center or the average. A lot of us already know how to calculate the average. Let's consider this as a sample. So our notation would be the sample of the mean is the sum of x over n. We know what n is equal to. It's 24. So we would just need to sum all of these scores, which I've already <clears throat> blocked out, but I can erase all of that. And we can go back and take our calculators and add um, this all of the values in this distribution. And um, I've already done that and I had come up with 165 as the sum of x. 165 divided by 24 is 6.875. Um, since I'm um, working with the decimal, for the majority of our um, values will be rounding to the hundredths place, so two digits right of the decimal. So let's go ahead and do that for this example here. 
So given the third digit right of the decimal is 5, we're going to round up so it's 6.88. That's the mathematical center. The mean is equal to 6.88. Um, if we're working with a continuous variable, then this would be an appropriate representation of um, the mathematical center of the distribution. Another way we can think of the center is the median, what we're going to learn a lot more about in Chapter 3, but that describes the middle, the middle score. So if we have 24 scores, right, 24 was our sample size, if we just consider half of that um, 12 scores. So the x value that represents the 12th score or thereabouts because it's a, an even number of scores in the distribution. We're actually going to have two right in the center of the distribution. Um, if we consider, you know, just the 12th score as the middle, it would really be, you know, the 12th and the 13th score um, that would tell us what the center of the distribution is equal to. The frequency um, over here, we can look at the frequency. The score of um, x equal to 2, that has a frequency of 1, that score of 2 is the first score. Then we move up, a score of x equal to 3 is the second score. A score of 4 represents the third and the fourth score. So again, I'm over here looking at the um, frequency and understanding it in terms of if I were to lay out all the scores um, from lowest to highest, again, stretching out the information. So 2 occurred once, 3 occurred once, 4 occurred 2 times, 5 occurred 2 times, 6 occurred 3 times, 2, 3, 7 occurred 4 times, oops, not a 4, a 7, one, two, three, four. Eight occurred five times. One, two, three, four, five. Nine occurred four times. One, two, three, and four. And ten occurred twice. Okay, so I have 24 scores. Again, if we think of the center, it's, um, you know, the, the around half of that would be 12. Um, and so let's just consider the 12th score. So this would be the first, the second, the third, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and the 12th score. Um, so and these just coincidentally are all sevens in the middle, right? So kind of this is the center of the distribution. This is the 12th score here. Right, it's kind of the center. Really, it would be the average um, of the two middle scores. You know, determining that we have 50% of scores over here and 50% over here. Okay, um, but again, this is these are just estimations and kind of prepping us for this understanding of median, the middle score. We understand again the mathematical center is the mean. We calculated that, and the center score. Here, if we stretch all the data out, it's, it appears to be um, represented by an x value of 7. And, um, but if we considered the mode, the mode is the highest um, occurring score. So if we look at our data, that would actually be 8. Okay, so we, if we report the median, and of course this, this example doesn't ask for all of this, but it's a good introduction to what's coming in Chapter 3. And the mode is the uh, score that has the highest frequency, in this case, 8. Okay, so we can answer number 2 by um, specifying one of these three. Um, but we would agree that the middle is somewhere between 7 and 8, perhaps. Again, using just an estimation, uh, if we round up the mean, again, because the distribution is skewed, these values aren't going to be equal. When the distribution is symmetrical, the mean, median, and mode will all be the same value. Okay, so given the fact that we calculated or found or located the center in, in the case of 
looking at looking for the median. So let me go back here and save somewhere between seven and eight um, would represent the center score. If they're not equal, the distribution is skewed. Now to determine if it's skewed, we used our um, histogram to see that the tail is being pulled to the negative. We have higher frequency represented by our higher scores. So let's go back to one and we recognize that it's pop negative skew. The center would be represented by an X value of anywhere between seven and eight. Um, we went a step further and identified the actual three scores that would represent the center defined by different things, the mean, mathematical mean, the actual center of the distribution, and the highest, um, most occurring score, the mode, which was eight. And then lastly, number three says, are the scores clustered together or are they spread out across the scales? And the scores are clustered at the high end of the distribution. Again, when we determine that it's positive, excuse me, negatively skewed, we see that the scores are, are highly concentrated over here on this end of the distribution. As we move into chapter three, you know, all of this will help us better understand the concepts of measures of central tendency. And we recognize that we have three measures of central tendency that can give us a sense of the distribution that we're working with. And we can quickly assess, once we identify those three measures of central tendency, if the distribution is positively skewed, negatively skewed, or symmetrical zero skew. Okay, last one, number 21. Recent research suggests that the amount of time that parents spend talking about numbers can have a, high, a big effect on the mathematical development of their children. In the study, the researchers visited the children's homes between the ages of 14 and 30 months and recorded the amount of number talk they heard from the children's parents. The researchers then tested the children's knowledge of the meaning of numbers at 46 months. The following data are similar to the results obtained in the study. Sketch a polygon showing the frequency to Excuse me, the, um, the following data are similar to the results obtained in the study. Sketch a polygon showing the frequency distribution for children with low number talk parents. In the same graph, sketch a polygon showing the scores for the children with high number talk parents. Does it appear that the, there is a difference between the two groups? Um, so excuse the interruption um, a minute ago. We have our data here for low number talk parents, I've underlined with blue, um, and then high number talk parents in red. I'm going to go to the next page to give myself a little bit more room and begin with a frequency table. It's a little easier to start there to then convert that information into a graph. So we'll move to this next page and um, I'm going to construct a consolidated frequency table. So we have our X values. And I'm going to put my frequency for my low group and my frequency for my high group. Okay, my scores range from 5 is the highest score in both distributions all the way down to 1, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. So if we consider the low group first, um, a score of 5 occurred once. And I'm just going to clear this up a little bit. A score of four occurred once and twice, two times. A score of three, one, two, three, four. A score of two, we have one, two, three, four, five. A score of one, one, two, three. Okay, so now we'll consider 
the high um, number top parents and look at their distribution. So a score of 5 occurred 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times. A score of 4 occurred 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 times. A score of 3 occurred 1, 2, 3 times. A score of 2, once. And a score of 1, 0. Okay. Just by looking at the data, we can see a difference um, in the performance of, of the young children, the toddlers, in their knowledge of um, meaning of numbers. So we have a greater frequency with these x values of 5, 4, and 3 in the um, high number top households. All right, so now I'm going to take that data and convert it into a polygon and I'll place them together on one so we can assess the differences. All right, so here is my frequency and my x values oh, on our ordinate one, two, three, four, five, and six. And our x values range from zero to six, or excuse me, our, our frequency ranges from zero to, to um, six, and our x values range from one to five. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to carry this out to six because this is a polygon, and I'm going to have to bring it down to the x value that's not represented that would have a frequency of zero. All right, so for the first um, part of this table up here, we'll consider this column. Um, we have an x value on the low end, beginning with 1, and it has a frequency. So an x value of 1 has a frequency of 3, and um, x value of 2 has a frequency of 5. An x value of 3 has a frequency of 4, and an x value of 4 has a frequency of 2, and an x value of 1 has a frequency of 1. Let's see if I can change the color here to graph this. Again, since this is a polygon, we have to begin at the abscissa, so the score of 0 did not occur, therefore it has a frequency of 0. Take this up this way. Again, we bring it down to the abscissa by considering the x value above the highest x value of the distribution. In this case, the highest score is 5. One score above that would be 6, and it would have a frequency of 0. So we properly bring it down to the abscissa. All right, so this is our low number top distribution. And now we'll consider the high number taught um, distribution, the parents that, that use a lot of numbers while talking to their toddlers and see the effects on the child's development of um, number meaning. All right, so we consider the, the lowest value of 1, and it has a frequency of 0. And then a score of 2 has a frequency of 1. The score of 3 has a frequency of 3. The score of 4 has a frequency of 6. And the score of 5 has a frequency of 5. Again, it's a polygon. We need to bring it down to the abscissa. And the score of um, 1 has a frequency of 0, so that is okay here. We bring our curve up and down, and to complete this polygon, we bring it down to the x value above the highest score. The highest score is 5. The next score above that would be 6, and it would have a frequency of 0. Okay. So this is the, um, the resulting graph polygon for both data sets. 
And visually, given um, this representation, we could conclude at this point that it appears that, that parents that do use a lot of number talk, you know, they're using numbers and describing things in the household, um, talking about, let's say, for example, um, portions of the pizza and fractions um, and other things, counting minutes, um, expressing things as a quarter of an hour or half past the hour, so on and so forth. All of those things are documented and it appears that parents that do engage in more number talk um, socialize their children in a way that they have a greater meaning or understanding of the meaning of numbers. Um, again, we caution ourselves from drawing definitive conclusions about the data, but the data does illustrate that there is a difference. It would be our job as um, statisticians or as researchers to determine if this difference um, were statistically significant.